Okay, good evening everybody. Um, I'm assuming that you can hear me all. Um, if there is somebody who could please mute their mic or their telephone. Uh, to mute the telephone you press star six. Just star six to mute the telephone and uh, we'll be good. Good to go. Okay. All right. Um, tonight's class is actually dedicated. Tonight's class is dedicated by some very devoted and dedicated students. Uh, including, it's a group that learns together, Wendy, Shelley, Annie, Galen, Kimberly, Dennis, Andrea, and Alan, or Ellen, I'm not sure how to pronounce the name, maybe Ellen would probably be the right way, uh, for the, they dedicated this class tonight, and uh, we want to thank them very much, really appreciate it, and um, they should have a very healthy, sweet, and peaceful year. Um, again, whoever's listening on the, um, by telephone, please, if you don't mind, um, mute yourself by pressing star six, star six. I'm not sure how else I could do it at this point in time, but in any event, if you don't mind doing it, that would help. Okay. So tonight, uh, today actually. Today was a, uh, in fact, quite a special day. Um, it was the 25th of Elul. Just for those who aren't aware of it, um, the Jewish day really begins at night so, and ends with uh, when the stars come out, or at sunset, according to some, but when the stars come out for sure. So the previous day ended at um, uh, when the stars came out. And so we're talking essentially really about yesterday, but Wednesday. <clears throat> Today's already Thursday, technically, in the Jewish calendar. I know in the regular calendar it only begins at midnight, but um, there you go. I'm assuming the uh, sound is good, yes? <clears throat> okay. Yep. All right, good. So, um, today was the 25th day of Elul, which is the day on which... According to uh, Jewish tradition, the day on which the world was created. Man was in fact created on the sixth day of creation, the sixth day. Uh, but the world was created on um, today, the 25th of Elul. Man was created on the first day of Tishrei. First day of Tishrei, which is on the sixth day of creation. Now we find a very strange thing. That the actual celebration the actual celebration of the new year is celebrated on the sixth day of creation and not on the first day of creation. Why should that really be? If we're talking about the new year, new creation, the new beginning, everything new really began on the 25th day of Elul and not on the first day of Tishrei, the first day of Tishrei, which would be the sixth day of creation. So why this apparent discrepancy? Um, between the actual time and when we celebrate it. Now, the answer that's, that's given is because the creation itself is not necessarily something to celebrate, <laughs> believe it or not. It's not something to celebrate for a very simple reason. And that reason is that the creation without having any... Um, without having any purpose to it, the creation without having any, um, any goal is really not, nothing much, it's not anything, it's, it's just, it just is. In fact, even more than that, the creation of the world, in order for the world to be created, so Kabbalah explains that initially, the only thing that there was, was the presence of God. 
That's all that there was. And then came, it was, we can't talk about it chronologically because time did not exist yet. But at a certain stage, there was, so to speak, God's revelation of himself to himself. God's revelation of himself to himself. Which is usually called in Kabbalistic terminology the Or Ein Sof, the infinite light. In other words, the infinite revelation of God. But since there was no creation yet, one would have to say the infinite revelation of God to himself. That's called the Or Ein Sof, the infinite light. It was only after that that the world was created in order for existence to be created. In fact, it wasn't the world that was created. When I say the world, we mean the world that's, that we see all around us. The spiritual worlds were created before. If not chronologically, then in terms of uh, quality. There was qualitative planes of existence that existed before this world in which we find ourselves. Now, in order to create any of the worlds, the word world in Hebrew is spelt olam. I'm just going to write it in the chat box so anyone can see if they want O-L-A-M in, uh, in English. And in Hebrew, that would be Aleph, Vav, Lamed, Men, Mem, Olam. Olam is from the same word as the Hebrew He'elem. He'elem is concealment. In other words, in order for God to create a world, for the world to exist as it exists now, any of the worlds, any of the planes of existence, he has to, so to speak, conceal himself. Now, he's not concealing himself from himself because that's, that doesn't really work. Uh, God doesn't con conceal himself from himself, but he conceals himself from what will be the various planes of reality or the various planes of creation. Now, let me just explain that for a minute by way of an analogy. Let's say that you have a child who you're teaching to read. Now, in order to teach, to teach the child to read, you obviously, um, being that um, you know, you're a professor of literature in um, Harvard or Princeton or <laughs> Yale or whatever, Columbia, um, obviously, if you're going to start sprouting a lecture in uh, you know, the inner recesses of Shakespearean um, uh, technique and so on, uh, your five-year-old kid is not really going to understand very well. So what do you do in order to be able to explain to your child a concept which he's reading and he doesn't understand or a word which he's reading and he doesn't understand? So you narrow down your thought process, process and you focus on one specific thing and explain it to him in ways that he can understand. We've used the analogy before of trying to explain 2 plus 2 equals 4 by 2 oranges plus 2 oranges equals 4 oranges, and that's how you go about it. So the same thing over here, you have to bring it down to a much lower level. That bringing it down to a lower lower level is called he'elem, he'elem. Concealment, or the technical term for it in Kabbalah is tzimtum. Tzimtum. The tzimtum means the contraction or really the concealment of godliness in order to have a very very limited revelation that limited revelation technically speaking is called in kabbalah the kav the kav meaning a line of light just a line not light spread out just a very thin so to speak a uh, pencil thin line of light a laser beam focus um, where the light doesn't spread out at all and from the infinite light, there's now just this very thin beam of light from which all of the worlds evolve. Or rather, let's be more accurate, from which all of the worlds devolve because they go from higher to lower, not from lower to higher. So we, talk, we speak about devolution rather than evolution. Um, now, the creation, therefore, the creation of the worlds was, therefore, a process in which God concealed himself in five levels, essentially five levels of concealment or five worlds. The higher the world, the less the concealment. 
the lower the world, the greater the concealment. And in general, there are five planes of existence, which are called from top to bottom, will be called Adam Kadmon, or Ak for short, Adam Kadmon, then Atzilut, and then Bria, Yetzirah, and finally Asiya. Asiya is the spiritual underpinning of this physical world in which we live the spiritual backdrop to this physical world. So those five worlds, five planes of reality, are created by concealment. So therefore, comes along Kabbalah and says, um, this is not, nothing really to be celebrated. Concealment is not something to be celebrated. When do we celebrate something? And by the way, let's just explain this concept of celebration and commemoration. Um, as everybody knows, um, the regular New Year is celebrated usually uh, in many, many parts of the world, obviously. But uh, in America, probably the uh, chief attraction is the celebration of uh, New Year in Times Square in New York, where hundreds of thousands, not millions of people gather, and uh, they celebrate the New Year um, by a lighting of fireworks and then getting drunk and then... <laughs> Um, I don't know what else, but um, hopefully without riots, hopefully happily. But in any event, that's how New Year is celebrated in the, in the secular world. I suppose to a certain extent you could say that the secular world is, re is, is celebrating the creation of the world, even though it's on the wrong date, according to Jewish uh, teachings, but they're celebrating the creation of the world, in other words, the concealment of godliness, you know, fireworks and get drunk and uh, let's enjoy life. Uh, enjoying life is not a bad thing, but um, there's a lot more depth to it than that, as I'm sure everybody's aware without um, getting into it any further. So, um, the idea then is the celebration of the new year. What does it mean to us? It doesn't simply mean a celebration of us being here. It means a celebration of a certain task that we have been given. It's a celebration of a task that we have been given and the tools which we have been given to accomplish that task. What is the task? The task is the to, to tran transform, that's what I'm looking for, to transform the concealment by which the world was created into revelation, to transform the concealment, the darkness, into light. To transform, the, to transform the darkness into light. That is the goal, that's the mission, transforming darkness into light. And we've been given tools to be able to do that. One of the tools which we are given is that we have a soul. The soul is spoken about in, um, in, in, uh, in various verses, but explained at length in Kabbalah and even more so in Hasidic teachings, that the soul is essentially part of God above. What is the soul? Explains Rabbi Yitzhak Luria, the Arizal, explains that the soul is a spark of godliness which is contained within a spark, a spark of the creator, within a spark of the created, a spark of God within the human being, within the soul of the human being. Now, what we are celebrating, therefore, is the fact that we were created, essentially, in the divine image. Not simply that we were created, but that we were created as so to speak, a, I don't want to say a mirror image, but as an image of godliness down below in this world, a reflection of God down below in this world. That's what a human being is, a reflection of God. Well, along with that celebration comes a tremendous feeling of responsibility, essentially awe and responsibility because the task is a tremendous one and we are being given tremendous powers to be able to accomplish it. But the task itself is a huge task. We, in a sense, have to undo, 
in a sense. We have to undo what it is that God did. He created the world through concealment. We have to recreate the world and bring revelation into it. Yael, uh, we including not, are, we, are we including non-Jewish souls? We are including everybody in the sense that everybody is part of Adam, and Adam was the one who was created in the divine image. So we all have the divine image. Jewish people have been given a special task in this particular um, framework, but everybody has essentially the same, uh, the same duties. The same duties is to make the world into a settled place, into a place which is ready to receive the revelation of godliness, and sooner or later to transform the darkness into light. That's what it's all about. So everybody's included as far as that's concerned. So the task, therefore, that we are confronted with on uh, Rosh Hashanah, the head of the year, and it's normally called the head of the year, not just the beginning of the year. It's not just the new year, it's the head of the year. Because as we all know, all of the powers of the body um, are essentially contained within the head. It's true that the head can't walk to the street corner and uh, go, in, go, go to the store on its own. It needs the legs. On the other hand, the legs without a head also wouldn't be able to do much. So it's a symbiotic relationship. There's a relationship between them. But the power of the legs and the direction that the feet go in, that the feet walk, is what comes from the head, hopefully. Why well, I say hopefully is because um, <laughs> I guess there are people who are walking around uh, who don't use their heads very often. Um, and there are people that have heads but don't use them, and the people that um, unfortunately um, choose not to use their heads at all, even though they know they have them. All right, let's not get into let's not get into the negatives. Let's keep it all positive over here. Uh, so, the idea was the idea is that um, when um, <laughs> yeah, you can't laugh online, huh? Uh, when I muted you, okay. I'll unmute you for a minute. <laughs> okay, so um, the idea then is because everything is contained in this time, the time that Adam, the day that Adam was created, it's a very auspicious day and it's a very momentous day. This is a day in which we have to put in tremendous effort into trying to... Oh, sorry. Sorry, getting inundated from every side here with phone calls. Excuse me a second. Okay, let's continue. Um, right. So, it's a day, therefore, which contains within it the entire year to come, and it's a very momentous day for that reason. I have explained before that on the day of Rosh Hashanah, in the head of the year, a new energy, or as it's referred to in Kabbalah and Hasidic teachings, a new light is brought into the world which was never manifested before. If you could think of a, uh, of a helix or a spiral, but a spiral going upwards, that spiral going upwards um, is representative of the way things work in the spiritual world. Spiritually, things are always in a state of advancing. It could be, it, it might look like we're just like circling with a drain, you know, kind of thing. It might look like we're circling the drain. But that's the, the Baal Shem Tov explained that a spiral staircase, if you just focus on what's in the middle of the staircase, in other words, the pole that you're going around, you might not seem to be making very much progress at all. 
But the truth is that you are making progress. It's not visible, but you are making progress. It might not be visible. But our sages tell us that every year there's a new level of light, a new level of energy that comes into the world that was never before in existence and is a higher level of energy, a higher level of light. And so we continue going up in this sort of upward, this upward spiral. Now, it could be um, that we may experience it as not quite like that. Uh, whoever is on the uh, on a phone, please press star six again if you don't mind. Um, there are some. Um, if I can, let me see if I can switch off this phone here. One second, folks. Ah, oh, yeah, the phone is off. Yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you. All right. So. <clears throat> um, the, the idea, again, is that um, we are progressing. But because we are progressing, moving upwards, the tasks that we have to fulfill are ever more critical. As we get higher and higher in a more and more spiritually rarefied atmosphere, we have to purify, rectify ourselves in such a way that we too are ready to be able to make use, to utilize that special power that we've been given for this year to expand our, to expand goodness in the world, to expand light in the world, to expand our spiritual footprint in the world, so to speak. It's a very, very important thing and something that is possibly um, misunderstood. Why do I say misunderstood? If we look around at the world, there's obviously... Um, yeah, I went to the participants. I muted everybody, but it seems to keep on unmuting. All right, whatever. Um, in any event... Um, if we look around at the world around us, there seem to be more and more problems, more and more issues which need to be thought about very seriously and it can make us, um, if, if you're the depressive type, <laughs> one could get depressed. Thank God I'm not a depressive type, but um, it's enough to make the regular person depressed if you, if you look around and you, uh, and you look around at the world in a certain way. However, what we have to do is we have to look at the world as a place of opportunities, a place where we have the opportunity, indeed, let's call it a privilege, rather than just the opportunity, the privilege of doing good things. I was just speaking to someone today, a private um, client, who um, actually lives in, um, he lives in Norway. And he's a very spiritual person, um, and he's come to the conclusion, or at least he's coming to the conclusion, that part of what it is that he has to do, why it is that he landed up in Norway, uh, he could have gotten jobs elsewhere, he's a very um, capable and talented young man. Uh, but he has this job in Norway, and he, he's convinced, and uh, I'm convinced too, that the reason that he's in Norway is because he has spiritual work that he has to do there. There's a story that um, uh, is told about a certain um, a disciple of Rabbi... Um, he was a disciple of Rabbi Shmuel of Lubavitch, the, the, the fourth Rebbe, the fourth spiritual leader of the Lubavitch movement, which was essentially based in Russia until it moved over to America in the last generation. Uh, last generation and a half, essentially. 19, 1950, 1950s it moved here. Um, with the previous Lubavitch, um, Lubavitch Rebbe, Rabbi Yosef Yitzchak of Lubavitch. In any event, during the uh, time, um, during the life of the fourth Lubavitcher Rebbe Rabbi Shmuel, he had a 
disciple who was um, a big, very, very wealthy man and a philanthropist at that. And um, he, he was a person that um, would fulfill enormous government contracts. He had the brains and the uh, wherewithal and the uh, organizational skills and so on and the ability to employ the right people. And he would get these enormous Russian government contracts. We're talking about in the 1800s here, uh, mid, to, uh, mid to late 1800s. So he was offered a huge contract to build a railroad to Siberia, a new railroad to Siberia. And for various reasons, he was very unsure about this. He wasn't sure that he wanted, even though it would have been a very lucrative project and so on and so forth. And um, nevertheless, he wasn't sure that he wanted to do it. So what do you do when you're not sure of something? You ask your rabbi, yeah? you ask your spiritual leader, you ask your... Um, your Rebbe, that's what he did. He asked his Rabbi, Rabbi Shmuel, who said to him, yeah, I think you should go ahead. Go ahead with the contract. So he says, yeah, but I'm gonna be there. It's gonna, you know, it's gonna be at least two years and I'm gonna to have to be in Siberia most of the time for those two years and uh, away from my family and um, this and then the other. So the Rebbe told him, Rabbi Shmuel told him, yes, I, said, I still think you should do it. <laughs> No matter what your, um, no matter what, I think you should do it. But this fellow was uh, rather stubborn and apparently not as smart as he thought he was. And he decided that all things considered, he is not going to go ahead with the contract. And, um, and he didn't. A couple of years later, um, they found uh, some, there were some anomalies in his accounting, some uh, questions about his accounting methods or whatever it was. The Russian government uh, prosecuted him and he, la and, he landed up, man, and he landed up in Siberia for about five years. <laughs> he landed up in Siberia for five years. When he came back, that's where they used to send people to prison. Uh, when he came back, <laughs> he went into his Rebbe and he said, um, he said, Rebbe, I see you were right. I should have gone to Siberia. So the Rebbe, the Rebbe told me, yeah, you should have gone because then you could have gone on your own volition. And not only that, but you would have got paid for it. Sorry about this, folks. There's someone who's trying to call me and he's just driving me nuts. <laughs> he wants, wants me to teach him how he can see the letters on a person's forehead. <laughs> I'm not about to teach him that. In any event, okay. So, um, so we understand that uh, being in a certain place at a certain time has its necessity. One is in a certain place at a certain time for a certain purpose. That purpose we might not be aware of, but we are aware of what it is I should tell him he needs more patience. Yes, I will. <laughs> this is about the fifth time he's calling me tonight, and I've always been busy in a meeting or whatever it was. I haven't been able to answer him in any of it. Okay, so um, the um, the purpose of our being, where it is that we are, we aren't always aware of. But what we are aware of is the strengths and the values and the talents with which we have been endowed. At least we should be aware of them. If a person is not aware of them, of what talents he has, and of course there are talents that one can develop on, it's, it's, not, a fixed, uh, it's not a fixed thing. But the talents with which we are endowed and the strengths of character and the strengths of soul, let's call them the powers of one's soul, um, Everyone has all the powers of the soul, but some are in greater, um, they're, they're, uh, in, in the balance of power, so to speak, in the soul, some are more dominant, some are less dominant. For example, with Abraham, Abraham, the power of chesed, of kindness, was more dominant in Abraham. The power of gevura, which is essentially the idea of 
the the elevation of soul in prayer and meditation was more dominant in Isaac, and so on and so forth. Everybody has their particular dominant characteristics and uh, and 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 talents and so on, focus and so on and so forth. So from the dominant characteristics that one has, and the talents that one has been granted one can understand what it is that one's job in the world is. For example, if a person is a great orator, such a person, if he would, in order to become uh, much more holy, if he would declare a, um, um, in Hebrew it's called a tani dibur, that he would, uh, he, he, would, he, he would fast with his words. In other words, he wouldn't speak. If he, um, there are people that take upon themselves these vows of silence, right? If a person who's a great orator would take upon himself a vow of silence as a permanent thing, he would obviously be doing the wrong thing, completely the wrong thing. He's been given a talent, use it. Um, I know people who have been given talents which, at first glance, do not seem to be talents which can be used for holy purposes. Um, for instance, dancing, and that's incorrect. Dancing is a, a holy art, or at least it can be, when it's done in the right way and done with the right modesty and done with the right, uh, with the right intentions. And in fact, there were, a, um, there, were, there were Hasidic rabbis, Rabbi Moshe Leib of Sasov, for example, who... Um, when he danced, that was his that was his method of worship. His dancing was his worship. And when he danced and people were watching him, they would get revelations just from his dancing. They would see things, they would experience things, they would understand things, they would have insights just from watching him dancing. So anything that one has been given can be used. Not only can it be used, but it should be used. In other words, again, the talents and strengths and, uh, and, 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 uh, and qualities of character, etc., that we have must be used in the right way. That doesn't mean to say that, therefore, one must abandon everything else. Let's say a person, for example, his, uh, his particular thing is, let's say, prayer. It doesn't mean to say that, therefore, he completely abandons outreach, reaching out to other people and helping other people and, and, and showing kindness and so on and so forth. No, but his main dominant thing that, that has to occupy and preoccupy him is prayer. And the other things are an addenda to prayer. In other words, they, 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 they come into this, they become a subset of his prayer. And so on and so forth with all the powers of the soul become a subset of the main gate through which we walk. Now, just for example, to take the example of prayer, there are um, traditionally 12 tribes of the children of Israel. It's explained that each tribe had their own um, prayer book. Slight variations, more or less the same structure, but slight variations in the manner of prayer of each tribe corresponding to the different gates through which each tribe would enter when they went into the temple. The temple had 13 gates. There were 12 tribes. Each tribe, if you knew the tribe you came from, only went through the gate that belonged to that, uh, that was designated for that particular tribe when you would go into the, uh, the temple. There was a 13th gate for people who didn't know their tribe or for people who had converted or um, um, for when the temple would be destroyed, that 13th gate remained open. According to, to, to tradition, that 13th gate, the 13th gate is the gate which was revealed to Rabbi Yitzhak Luria, to the Arizal the founder of modern Kabbalah. That was the 13th gate. 
Right, so says Yael, her roommate in seminary studied dance and became a teacher to autistic children to help them to interact. Well, that's wonderful. See, there you go. Perfect example. Excellent. Thank you for sharing. Okay, so each of us has to take this idea if we want to really build a world and utilize the powers that we've been given in the best possible way, each of us has to take what we were given and formulate it into a mission, into a goal, into a, um, a calling, let's put it that way, into a calling that this is, his, this is his calling. Now, it could be this is a calling just at this particular stage of life. And as one gets older, uh, a different calling can happen. And you might find, you might, might have found that when you were younger, you felt you had one calling, and then that can be transformed into something else later on. Uh, that does happen, um, and it happens for a very good reason. Usually, it has to do with, uh, with, with, with age, as one goes through various stages in life. But it also could happen, it could, do with, it could have to do with the fact that a person may complete a certain function that he had to do, a certain task for which his soul came to this, came down to this world for, and now he's given a new one. In a very general sense, on Rosh Hashanah, on the Jewish New Year, that is in fact what happens. This new light that comes into the world means it's a new aspect, a new facet of the tasks that we have been given in the world. For some people, it could be the beginning of a whole new mission in life, a whole new calling. For others, it's just an enhancement of a previous one or a different facet of the previous continuation of what they were doing before, but in a higher and more spiritual and more elevated and more profound manner. So that's why uh, the Jewish New Year is not a, um, uh, it's not a time for fireworks and getting drunk. Um, there, is, there are times to get drunk. <laughs> in the Jewish calendar, one of them is called Purim, right? Purim is a, um, uh, one of the celebrations of Purim is people actually do, uh, they do get drunk, but it's not a drunken, wild, drunken stupor and a wild, drunken like behavior and so on. It's, it's a way of sort of getting beyond yourself once a year. We'll talk about it when Purim comes, but anyway. Um, there's a time for everything, as King Solomon uh, said, there's a time for everything. There's a time for celebration, there's a time for joy, there's a time for alcohol, I guess, and then there's a time for, uh, for, for being serious. And Rosh Hashanah is a time for seriousness with joy. Seriousness with joy. Gilu birata, rejoice with trembling. That's what it's all about. So we're coming up to that day, um, the sixth day of creation, when man was given his task of rectifying and elevating, uplifting the world and everything around him. And so that's what we have to take into uh, consideration. How do we uplift the world? How do we change things? How do we move forward? How do we become the true reflection of godliness with which we were, cre we were created? Or in which we were created and uh, when a person contemplates on that and if that's his um, his or her uh, focus on that holy day then um, and we're talking about uh, Sunday night Monday and Tuesday those are the days so ladies and gentlemen that will be it for now um, uh, unless the questions which I'll be happy to answer um, just let me point out that there will 